Hi, my name is Patrick Rosal, and this is called Sundiata Elegy, um, and it's a it's an elegy for um, Seku Sundiata, and um, Seku is has been a huge influence on me and my work um, because he was so many things, and um, he did so many collaborations, and he thought about art and community in these really dynamic and expansive ways <clears throat> that were also super intimate and um, um, I'd known about his work for a long time and just before he passed away we had um, we had been in touch he came to one of my readings and he reached out to me and said we gotta we got to do something together and um, that was, um, that was sort of an incredible validation of not my work necessarily, but the approach that I wanted to take in making poems and sound and performance and being with other people. Um, needless to say, I, I was, I was sad that, um, <clears throat> Seku passed away before we got a chance to do that collaboration. <clears throat> um, I did get a chance to be in a, a tribute ensemble led by the great Latasha Nevada Diggs, um, and Doug Kearney was was in there, um, and that was a really it was a really beautiful experience to be able to perform um, works in his honor. So this <clears throat> this poem is called uh, Sundiata Elegy. <clears throat> it takes place in a uh, in the Dominican Republic, and it's the story, in some ways, of a guitar and me meeting a uh, um, a gentleman from Haiti um, who worked at this this resort that I was staying at in Dominican Republic. Sundiata elegy. Seku, only weeks after you died, I met a man named Elman at a resort in Puerto Plata. His job, to stand at the commissary entrance every day to make sure the guests had properly paid and didn't show up naked for breakfast. Elman studied French history, wrote in Creole, and every morning stepped into his beige company issue khakis to welcome as a sort of friendly sentry the Dutch, the English, the well-to-do Americans, He'd raised his several siblings himself and sent each week what money he could to his family in Port-au-Prince. Every morning, we chatted in Spanish like two men met in common exile, quick to open the doors of their inner laughter. The afternoon we first talked, I offered him a book of poems, which he took not as a gift, but in barter. I'd heard Elmond several times singing, strumming a beat up steel string and asked if I could perhaps take the guitar just a couple days until I left and would he hold this book in the meantime as collateral to which he twice said yes. And for a day and a half, I was the one son of a bitch on Hispaniola singing with my cracked voice a full repertoire of corny ballads. At one point, a man named Angel, who folded towels at the main pool, came up to me on the beach, shushed me, and took the guitar away. Then, as if to make further good on his name, he sang to me, Quisiera ser un pez, offering that ancient wish with all the sweetness of flesh and honey. After, he held the instrument at arm's length, gazing into it as if he himself had cut and planed its wood. Clearly, it wasn't so much the guitar he admired, but all the hands through which it had passed. Angel began to name for me not just Elman, but every one of a half dozen men working at the resort who shared the guitar. Busboy, custodian, bartender, musicians, 
all of them. Javier, Berto, Santiago, and Rocky, the blind masseuse who claimed to hear things we could merely see. Each man keeping the guitar for some time, then relinquishing it to the next man until it was his turn to hold it an hour or so, as I had, a couple days at most. An angel mused the guitar must have been older than the oldest of all the workers, smuggled into lovers' bedrooms, banged around in cramped buses and the back rooms of saloons. Angel shoved the guitar back into my arms and told me to sing on. The morning of my flight home, I found Elman at the entrance of the commissary reading to a woman from the book I left him, which I told him to keep as if our trade were even in the first place. He put it down to make room for the guitar in his lap. I thanked him again and shook each of his hands goodbye. As I walked off, Elmond drew a cord across the strings and the woman, with her eyes still locked on him, sprang up, snapped her chin over her shoulder and tipped her hips in rhythm a few times. Even her small collapse into laughter on beat to Elmond's bachata croon. Sometimes I wonder if music isn't just another version of light slowed down enough for the living to dance with the living. Brother, wherever you are, I like to think you'll ask a pretty lady to dance with you tonight. If so, I hope you'll listen for the distant music of borrowed guitars. Surely you've been waiting for news. So I'll tell you this, it's cold in New York and raining hard so that a million strings right now shimmer through the alleys of your city. You had a gift for hearing what the rest of us could only see. You took up a whole nation's rage with two good hands and heaved it above your head, hauled it down our boulevards, bore it on your back through this adagio throb of blue dream and steel. You turned it all into song. I know this much. There is a man in Puerto Plata who can tell me everything I need to know about the history of France in a language his great-grandfathers made up. I've come back to live in someone else's house in the richest country in the universe. None of us belongs anywhere without love. Everything has begun to die. Some of us keep shouting your name. Thank you, and thanks to the Poetry Society of America.